Hi everyone, I'm Davide and today we will see a practical tutorial on how to estimate future revenues by calculating a reasonable growth rate that avoids overestimating the intrinsic value of stocks during DCF analysis in order to take better investment decisions. The most important part of a DCF analysis is the projection of future revenues from which we will derive the future free cash flows. But this one is also the most delicate. Be too optimistic and you will end up overvaluing a stock taking a non worth investment. Be too conservative and you will end up undervaluing a stock and miss an investment opportunity. To estimate future growth in revenues, investors may use three different methods. The first one is using historical rates. Looking back at the past, investors can use the average growth rate let's say of the last 5 to 10 years, to project future growth in revenues assuming the company will achieve the same results. The problem is that history is never an attainable source to predict the future. Yes, past rates can be used during a preliminary analysis to determine if the business model of the company proved to be successful over time in order to get an overview of what we can expect from the company in the future. A company with a long history of steady growth in revenues is certainly more trustworthy than a company with a history of declining revenues. Anyway, relying only on past growth rates to project future growth should be avoided given its lack of attainability, especially because depending on which time period we choose, like 3, 5 or 10 years, the historical rate may change considerably, leading to misleading results. The second method is using analyst estimates. But despite these rates being produced by professional figures, they shouldn't be trusted blindly. Analysts are affected by many biases that characterize their profession. Among the others, analysts act on behalf of the investment banks or financial companies that hire them, therefore the growth rate forecasted by them may be spoiled to satisfy their employers' interests. Growth rates published by analysts should be used as check rates with which investors check the growth rate they come up with to determine if there is any significant difference and if a knowledge one, go check if that difference is due to a personal mistake, like missing some important news about the company or the impact of macro factors, or if it is just due to overconfidence or over pessimism of the analyst. Finally, we have the fundamental method, that despite being more time consuming, is the one that leads to the most objective estimation of future growth. Long story short, this meter is based on how much and how well a company reinvests to sustain its growth. The more a company reinvests and the more efficient it is at investing, the higher the expected growth rate will be. A key pillar of this method is the determination of the growth drivers in which the company has to reinvest to keep fueling its growth. But to better understand how to come up with this rate, we will proceed with a practical example using Align Technology, a US company that designs and manufactures clear aligners under the famous brand Invisalign. So the first step is looking at the 10K published by Align to determine how its business model works and which are its growth drivers. Reading through it, it's clear that its business model is based on the development of clear aligners, oral scanners and related software products to cure teeth problems. Therefore, its main growth driver is represented by the investment made in research and development to support the development of new aligners and the other related products that comprise its offers. In addition to that, we can consider growth drivers also the investment made in both capital expenditure and acquisition to sustain the research and manufacturing process with new facilities, equipment and know-how from acquired companies. Choosing the right growth drivers is a crucial part. And growth drivers will vary depending on which company we are analyzing. In simple words, a growth driver is represented by those expenses or better investments that are essential to sustain the growth of a company and that will deliver their return in the future. Without those investments, the business model of a company cannot function. This approach is called the fundamental method precisely because it requires you to thoroughly understand the company you are analyzing in order to determine its growth drivers. So moving on with our example, we report the revenues and the growth drivers for the last 10 years. As we will see later, we need the data to go back that much because the investment made to sustain growth usually deliver their results over a long period. The compound annual growth rate in revenues 
of a line from 2011 to 2021 is 23.5%. And that tells us that the business model of a line has proved to be able to deliver high growth rates over a long period. Another data that we need is the amount of capital invested by the company in operating activities, which is represented by equity and debt from which we subtract cash equivalents. Equity and debt represent the capital raised from both shareholders and third parties and used to fund operating activities, while cash and equivalents need to be subtracted because they do not represent an operating investment. Actually, they are the exact opposite. They are funds placed in very liquid financial instruments that are waiting to be invested by the company or used to repay debt. Having the revenues and their investments, we can calculate their investment margin for each of the 11 years considered. It is a margin that represents the percentage of revenues that have been reinvested by the company to support future growth. Then, having the revenues and the invested capital, we can also calculate the sales to invested capital ratio for each of the 11 years, which indicates how many revenues are generated for each dollar invested by the company. While their investment margin shows how much the company reinvests, the sales to invested capital ratio tells us how efficiently the company invests. The higher the ratio, the higher is the degree of efficiency of the company, and therefore we can expect higher growth rates in the future. Multiplying the reinvestment margin and the sales to invested capital ratio for each year, we obtain the expected growth rate based on how much and how well the company has reinvested for growth. But it's not over yet, because as we have said before, the investment made to sustain the growth delivered their returns in the long run, not in the year in which are made. To better capture this long-term phenomenon, we have to calculate the median value of these expected growth rates over the period considered. Choosing a period of around 10 years permits us to eliminate all the noise and volatility that generates in the short period due to external factors like a recession or no recurring factors like a big acquisition that, if taken singularly, can lead to misleading results overestimating or underestimating future growth. Calculating the median value guarantees us to eliminate outliers' values and so obtain a sustainable growth rate for the future. As regards a line, its expected growth rate is 24.9%, obtained as a median value for the last 9 years from 2013 to 2021. Now you may wonder why calculating the median value over 9 years and not 10 or 8. The time period is not random. I collected the data for 164 companies both from the US and the EU with growth attributes from 2005 to 2021 and calculated the expected growth rate in revenues for each year of all those companies. I calculated the median value for the whole period. But not every company had available data for each of the last 16 years. Some companies had available data only for the last 10 or 12 years, so I gathered the growth rates calculated from a period of at least 10 years to 16 years altogether. I then proceed to run a series of statistical analysis between the actual revenue growth registered by the company and the expected growth rate calculated with the fundamental method. It came out that the correlation between the actual growth and expected growth is 0.43. Not incredibly high, but still a positive correlation with a strong statistical significance given the p-value of zero. I also run a key-square test on the data and again the positive correlation between the actual and expected growth was confirmed with strong statistical significance. Finally, I run a regression using as independent variables their investment margin and the sales to investor capital and as a dependent variable the actual growth rate. The R-square is 0.25. Again, not incredibly high, but still, both the regression and the two variables showed a strong statistical significance with p-values equal to zero that permitted to confirm the positive linear relationship between the variables. I ran the same analysis also over a period of five years, but the correlation obtained was way weaker, equal to 0.23. So I discarded the hypothesis of a strong relationship between actual and expected growth rate over the short medium term. So I proved that in the long run, between 10 to 15 years, let's say, there is a positive statistical relationship between the investment made in growth drivers to sustain the growth and the actual growth rates registered by the companies. And that relationship can be used to estimate future revenues. 
And this is the key to understanding why we calculate the median value over nine years. If we already have the expected growth rate for the most recent nine years, to estimate the growth rate for the next year, assuming the company will keep investing at the same rate with the same efficiency, we can simply use the median value calculated over nine years as the expected growth and add here to the calculation of the expected growth rates. But adding the median value won't make the median value calculated over 10 years changing at all if compared to the one over 9 years. And being proved that there is a statistical relationship over a period of 10 to 15 years, we can theoretically use the same approach to estimate the future growth for the next 3 to 5 years, applying the median value to each of the next 5 years. Of course, to do that, we need to assume that the company will keep investing at the same rate with the same efficiency for the next five years, maintaining the same expected growth rate. Anyway, while it may be probable if assumed for the next year, over a five year period, it starts to be less plausible. Therefore, I personally applied for a maximum of three years in the future and only if the company has proved to have a history of steady growth. Going back to the line example, I assume revenues to growth at 24.9% for the next year. But being the DCF analysis made over a 10 year period, we need to estimate the growth rates for the remaining nine years. To do that, we can just assume that as the company will approach maturity by the 10th year, its revenues growth will start to decline slowly until aligning with the overall economic growth, locking the growth rate in a perpetuity state for the calculation of the terminal value. In practical terms, using the risk-free rate as a proxy for the overall economic growth rate, in this case equal to 4.29%, Starting from here too, we can make the growth rates declining at a constant rate calculated using this formula, which calculates the exact percentage at which the growth rate of 24.9% has to decline for the next 9 years until reach 4.29% by year 10. Therefore, the compound annual growth rate over a 10 year period is 11.86%, with revenues expected to be around $12 billion, meaning that they will triple in 10 years. Now, looking at analyst forecasts, they expect a compound annual growth rate of 17% from 2021 to 2026, with revenues to be around $8.6 billion. While with our calculation, we can expect a compound annual growth rate of 17.4%. For the same period with revenues around 8.8 .8 billion dollars by 2026. So we can say that our projections are in line with the market. We using this approach, we just have to assume the expected growth rate for the next one to three years, based on how much and how well the company has reinvested in its growth drivers, and then let it slowly decline as the company gets bigger and bigger and reduce the investment to sustain the growth, increasing its margin and profitability. The fundamental method permits us to estimate a reasonable and sustainable compound on a growth rate for the next 10 years based on how much and how well the company invests to sustain its future growth. But it requires us to thoroughly understand how the business model of the company works before projecting any single value into the future. Before concluding, it's mandatory to underline that even with this method, we won't estimate the exact growth rate. We probably won't get even close to it. It's almost impossible to predict the exact growth rate, but a fundamental method should be used as a shield for investors to protect them from using non-sustainable growth rates in their analysis. Growth doesn't came out of nowhere. On an Excel spreadsheet, it's easy to get caught up by the numbers and apply a sustainable growth rates that will make the revenues of a company larger than the whole economy in perpetuity. The end goal is not the growth rate itself, but the amount of revenues at the end of the 10-year period. If the value we obtain is reasonable, then it doesn't matter if the growth rate we assume for the next year turns out to be completely different for the actual growth rate. In the short term, everything can happen, and it's hard to be precise while forecasting, but in the long term, the value tends to stabilize around the mean, and therefore it's easier to predict them. The main scope of this method, therefore, is to come up with a reasonable growth rate that takes into account the fundamentals of a company without overestimating its intrinsic value and protecting investors from making bad investment decisions.